Good morning and welcome to Unity of Charlotte. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Wonderful to have you here to be together in celebration of the one life living itself and expressing itself through us and as us always. In case you didn't know, I'm Marty Bacher. It's my privilege to serve as the spiritual dude here, main spiritual dude, top spiritual dude, um, and um, among other things. So we are here to help nurture a deep and mature experience of God through the practice of unity principles. Simply put, we are here to love and to grow and to serve. We believe that being in spiritual community enhances our experience of life. It makes it richer and deeper and more expanded. So we're grateful to come together. We're grateful for your presence here today. If you're joining us for the first time, we just want to welcome you. We want you to sit back and relax and enjoy yourself. If you have questions, you'll see people that have blue ribbons. They are knowledgeable in all things Unity of Charlotte. You can ask them anything, um, except to borrow money. They're not, <laughs> I tried that, it didn't work at all. So, um, so if you're, um, <laughs> sorry. They give me a script and everything, and I still can't do it. I don't know what that's about. Uh, so anyways, if you're in need of spiritual support, we do have our ministry of prayer. Our, we have our healing and wholeness group meeting this af after the service. What they would love to be of service to you as well. You can also go online to add prayer requests there. So we invite you to avail yourself of the many opportunities taking place here. Anyways, let's begin our inward journey as we just enter into our prayer this morning. And taking this moment to simply give thanks. To give thanks for the many blessings in our lives. For this opportunity to come together in spiritual community. For this opportunity to practice and deepen in these principles that set us free. We are reminded that there is one life and that life expresses in and through and as all of creation. It expresses through each of us gathered here. And how grateful I am for the many hands and hearts that come together every Sunday to provide this service, to provide this place. All of the people of service who volunteer so willingly of their time and their talent and treasure, we give thanks and we bless them. And we know that this day something powerful and profound happens. That that which needs to be said is said, and that which needs to be heard is heard, and there is a revelation of truth, and it is good. So we simply give thanks for this time together. We know that it unfolds perfectly. With a joyous and grateful heart, I simply allow it to be so, as together we say, and so it is. Amen.
If you will join me, today I commit to living a fulfilled life. My heart and mind are open to divine guidance. My intention is clear and I move forward with confidence. My thoughts, words, and actions are perfectly aligned. Today I commit to living a fulfilled life. Today's inspiration comes from, a, <clears throat> excuse me, a favorite of mine who was looking back at this and actually um, when I graduated from ministerial school, this was the theme for our graduation and it's been kind of a rallying cry all through my ministry. It's written by Dr. Howard Thurman, who many of you know is one of my favorites from a book called For the Inward Journey. And Dr. Thurman used to write each week a little passage that was in the bulletin, and, and some of them are just amazingly profound. He's a beautiful writer. Not everyone knows who Dr. Howard Thurman is, but he was a one of the he had one of the first interracial churches in America, and was very much a, um, a support to Dr. Martin Luther King and many others that followed in his path. And so he had a beautiful soul, a beautiful heart, and I return to him again and again when I want to feel that. Whatever he was feeling, that's what I want to feel. So this is called The Moments of High Resolve. Keep fresh before me the moments of my high resolve. Despite the dullness and barrenness of the days that pass, if I search with due diligence, I can always find a deposit left by some former radiance. But I had forgotten. At the time, it was full-orbed, glorious, and resplendent. I was sure that I would never forget. In the moments of its fullness, I was sure that it would illumine my path for all the rest of my journey. I had forgotten how easy it is to forget. There was no intent to betray what seemed so sure at the time. My response was whole, clean, authentic. But little by little, there crept into my life the dust and grit of the journey. Details, lower level demands, all kinds of cross currents, nothing momentous, nothing overwhelming, nothing flagrant just wear and tear. If there had been some direct challenge, some clear-cut issue, I would have fought it to the end and beyond. In the quietness of this place, surrounded by the all-pervading presence of God, 
my heart whispers. Keep fresh before me the moments of my high resolve that in fair weather or in foul, in good times or in tempests, in the days when the darkness and the foe are nameless or familiar, I may not forget that to which my life is committed. Keep fresh before me the moments of my high resolve. And so as we simply enter into that awareness, there is a part of us that is committed to something deep and profound, to our spiritual life, to our spiritual essence, to our remembering who we are. And perhaps we too have allowed the dirt and grit of the road, of the journey, to seep in. But today we allow ourselves to recommit to that which is highest within us, to that realization and recognition of the one life, that very life of God as our life and being. And so we simply open our hearts, we open our minds, we allow our light to shine brightly in the world. And we are not only blessed, but we are a blessing. It is good and very good. Thank you, God, and so it is. Amen.
Susan. Susan, Susan, Susan. Now you have to get off the stage. <laughs> oh my goodness, honey. You, you warned me. You warned me. So, okay, give me a minute. Whew. Mm. It is such a wonderful and amazing thing when we allow God to work through us. Yes. When we stand in the presence of the divine and realize that something greater is at work. You see, I don't know about you, but sometimes I have this thing that goes on that I feel as if God is separate. And so when I'm in that place, then when things get messy or whatever, then I'm like, okay, God, get in here and let's fix this. And then things mellow out, and then I'm like, okay, I'll take it from here. <laughs> right? No, am I the only one that does this? Or, you know, right? I got this, right? And that realization that all that there is is God, all that there is is the one life, this one presence, this one infinite being as our very life, and allowing that to express through us according to our own uniqueness, our own talents, our own abilities. Jesus said to us that, of, I, of myself, I do nothing. But it is this power within me, this presence, this Father within me that does the work. You see, we are, I talk about this all the time, that we are co-creative beings. And co-creative in the sense that we create nothing of ourselves. We did not create our lives. We got to have a life. But then there's one life and it's expressing through us. And so we become co-creative when we begin to understand that this presence and this power expresses through us according to our own belief. Jesus taught us this. He said to us sometimes, you know, he's walking around the people, healing this one, healing that one. And so, you know, it creates a stir. You know, when people start throwing down their crutches and having these amazing healings on, it's, you know, people start to pay attention to that. Try it sometime, you know. Go heal five or six people at the grocery store someday and see if people don't start showing up in your life. Right? The word travels fast. Right? But he would say this wonderful thing to them, and he would say, according to your faith, it shall be so. Do you believe I can do this? And if they said yes, then it's according to your faith. Likewise, if they said no, according to your faith, it will not happen. So that's when we talk about this idea of being co-creative beings in the one. We are not creating life, but we are working with life. And when we realize that the universe is supporting us and loving us and saying yes to us, then we start to pay a little more attention we said our affirmation to are my thoughts and my words and my actions in alignment because sometimes we say one thing and we do another now you may not but you know you're married to somebody that does that so you know what I'm talking about <laughs> and everybody looks at their house I told you right <laughs> right so sometimes we talk but we act differently. So what's that all about? Well, it turns out that we're always living according to our belief system, and our belief system, by and large, is subconscious. And so we may have grown up in a, in a context where, where there was messages that we received that said money is scarce. Money is something to be feared, or, or only bad people have money. And somehow we internalize those, and so we, start to, so we start to get to a place in our lives where more money is flowing in that subconscious belief. So, whoa. My own experience, when I was a child, I, my parents were going through a divorce. It was a crazy time. I don't know if you all remember the 60s, but there was a lot going on. And, and so not only were people being assassinated and were, you know, it was just this amazingly crazy time, but my parents were going through a very difficult time. And, and so I did what everybody likes to do. I blamed it on my dad. My dad traveled a lot. 
He was a businessman, and he built a very successful business, and it required him to travel a lot. So he was gone a lot. So in my childish way of perceiving, I blamed him. That if he'd been more available, if he'd been like Ward Cleaver, like all dads are, um, you know, then everything would have been different. Right? He became my scapegoat. And I remember in a moment of pain and anguish talking to my friend. I was 10, 12 years old. And I said, if that's what it takes to be successful, I will never be successful. Now, let's talk about consciousness. A thought matched with strong emotion becomes a belief. Perfectly realistic thing for a 12-year-old kid to say or think or feel. Got stored in the subconscious mind. Fast forward a decade or so later, and every time I was about to achieve some level of success in my life, something happened. Guess what happened? I happened. It wasn't like, like, you know, a dump truck rolled by and dropped rocks on me. It was like me sabotaging the good that was coming into my life because at a subconscious level, I was fearful of success. When I began to understand this way of thinking, and I began to understand that it was my belief that was participating with divine law to produce results, that God was neither rewarding me or punishing me at any time, but it was my own acceptance of my good, then I could begin to change the belief. I could begin to define success on my own terms. I could realize what I really wanted is the wholeness of what we might call a successful life, a fulfilled life. You see, for me, it's not enough to have money. In fact, money has never been the driving force for me. Big surprise. See, Reverend Mindy's here. Yeah, we went into the ministry because of the, you know, gets hold of some of that ministerial cash, right? <laughs> By the way, welcome, Reverend Mindy. Do you all know Reverend Mindy Odlin? Some of you would know her from our spirit groups. She's, you wouldn't recognize her not on the screen, but this is who she is. So thank you for being with us today. Right? It was never about money for me. It was about service. Now, money's an important part. I'm not saying do not hear this as money's not good. Money's an important part. But it was about having loving relationships. It was about the, f the fullness of life. Does the career work? Do the finances work? Do our relations work? Do our families work? Do all of those things that make us whole? Do we like being in our body? Do we care and nurture it? All of those things for me says, here's the successful life. And if you make a ton of money in the process, good on you. Keep tithing. <laughs> Right? We're good. Where you and I are good. As long, you can make as much as you want. You just keep tithing. We're good, right? Also help keep in balance. But it was, so for me, this journey was realizing I had adopted innocently some very negative beliefs. And so, you know, I've often told the story, I moved beyond that. My dad and I moved to, into a different level of relationship once I stopped blaming him for my life not working. Right? Have you ever noticed that when you don't forgive somebody? Really does a lot of damage to him, doesn't it? No. He was, he was, golf game was getting better and better. <laughs> he was making more and more money. His life was just fine. Now, mine, on the other hand, was falling apart. So you think, well, okay, this strategy maybe needs a little adjustment. And so I began to learn these principles, and I began to understand that when we are cooperating and co-creating with the divine, then as Reverend Sally talked about last week so powerfully, we're at decision points. We must decide. And decide, the word, I always love words, it decides mean to cut off. You see, when you decide on something, you cut off other things, right? Or hopefully, you know, if you decide to marry someone, I'm going to suggest to you, 
cut off the other options. <laughs> it goes nowhere good, right? <laughs> and then we get to look at commitment. Now, I could, I won't, but I could speak about commitment all day long. Because for me, it all lives in commitment. It all, what happens is that gap between what we say and what we do comes from our commitment. Quick survey. <clears throat> How many of you have ever set a goal for yourself, had a great idea, decided to do something even difficult, and it didn't happen? Pretty much all of us. Now, how many of you, likewise, have decided to do something, and although the circumstances didn't really support it, you still did it? Right? We've all done it. We've all done both. What's the difference? And the difference in my mind comes down to this idea of commitment. That when I, if I have a hopeful, wishful thing, wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be nice to lose 20 pounds? Sure. Wouldn't it be nice to be rich? Wouldn't it be nice to be in a relationship? <laughs> People ask me, why are you single? And I can understand why, would, you know, they, why they would ask that. And I say, because I know how to get along with me. <laughs> I mean, I used to even have arguments with myself from time to time, but, you know, at least I always win. So I figured that's good. <laughs> right? What's the difference? And for me, it's that commitment. And to, again, looking at the word, so the, to, the word commit comes from the Latin, and it means to, to join or entrust. So when you commit to a goal, you join it. You be, it becomes real. It's no longer a fantasy. You see, there's vision and fantasy are very similar. We can sit around all day long and say, oh, this would be lovely, and that would be lovely, and that would be wonderful, and wouldn't it be great if? But when we commit to it, when it becomes ours, then we move the ob obstacles out of the way to make it so. All of you that raised your hands and said, yes, I, commi I committed to and accomplished a difficult goal. Were there any obstacles? Yes. Oh, yes. Right? In fact, I'm sort of of the opinion that, that when we commit to something big and lofty, the universe then provides, I call it the are you sure button of the universe, <laughs> that something unlike that thing shows up. And that becomes the test of our belief. Right? It becomes the test of our belief. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Murray, uh, when Murray, the Scottish Himalayan expedition, has these famous words. We've all heard them. But listen to them. He says, until one is committed... There is hesitancy, the chance to draw back, always ineffectiveness, concerning all acts of initi initiative and creation. There is one elementary truth, the ignorance of which kills countless ideas and splendid plans. The moment one definitely commits oneself, then providence moves too. Then God moves to, then the universe t moves to. He says all things, sorts of things can occur to help one that would otherwise never have occurred. A whole st steam stream of events issues from the decision, raising in one's favor all manner of unforeseen incidents and meetings and material assistance which no person could have dreamed would have come their way. Right? That's where the magic happens. We used to facilitate a program all around this idea. And we, we would invite people to vision larger and then commit to action. 
And so sometimes we do, we do our Friday night thing and we all do the thing and we say, by the time you come back tomorrow morning, take an action. And we make them look at some other person, look them in the eye and say, I am my word. That makes it real, right? Because now no, it's not only you, but you know, you just told somebody else. And you're going to be accountable to them in the morning. And I can tell you, magic happened Friday nights and Saturday mornings. People forgave people they hadn't, had they carried a grudge for for years, or they took action, or they did something to get us out of that story that goes on in our head. Right? You see, because I believe commitment lives in action. In our teachings, it can be easy to think that it's always about thinking or saying the right words. If I just talk affirmatively, then everything follows. And better to talk affirmatively than not. I'm going to share that with you. But ultimately, until it becomes absorbed by in consciousness, it's not there yet. I believe that the universal law works at the level of our subconscious. And so when we're doing affirmations, it's about dripping that into the thing until that begins to feel real. Until it becomes real. Until it becomes the thing that we do and the way that we are. You see, I made a commitment to being of service, to sharing my gift, to doing my part to make the world a better place. And the avenue for me became ministry. Who knew? It was not in my plan. I often talk about I was the kid that once I, we dropped out of church at 12 years old, I was good. Never going to do that again. <laughs> right? Because I didn't believe in organized religion. I didn't believe in all of this stuff. Right? Did a lot of good. But lo and behold, if my life journey didn't land me smack dab in a church. And lo and behold, if I didn't begin to understand, that was my goal. That was my path. It's annoying. It's annoying when you pray to God and God gives you an answer and it's not the answer you want. <laughs> right? And yet I made a commitment. And it wasn't easy. I can, you know, I was, it, it was, I, it was, it's crazy when I think sometimes about what, my life has looked like in ministry, and yet I wouldn't change a minute of it. I wouldn't change a minute of it. And there was some part of me that was one with that. And in fact, I really had the realization, and here's what I want us to understand. When we become aware of our vision, when we become aware of who we are, then the circumstances don't matter because you're to be that person regardless of the circumstances. You got that? It's like, I'm not, I wouldn't, didn't wait to be a minister till I got a pulpit. Okay, they gave me a license. Look at me. Now I'm a reverend. Which, I'm good if you want to call me Reverend Marty. I prefer your holiness, but, you know, not so many people have, right? It's such a weird reverend. Yes, my child. Yes, my child. Right? But, you know, it's, what does that mean? It means whatever, right? It's a name. It's a title. And yet, am I that? So through, through my career, there's been times when I've done other things as well as ministry or when I've been in a support role in ministry. And, and so uh, I, I sold real estate for a while. And I said, you know, I was so successful at real estate that within just a couple of years, I was waiting tables. <laughs> I don't know if y'all remember what happened about 10 years ago, but turns out when you're selling real estate in a resort market, that's people stop buying condos and vacation homes and all that sort of thing before they stop a lot of other things. So, right? It's all right. It's all good. But you see, I never stopped being a minister. 
I wasn't a real estate agent by day, but Sunday morning I put on my minister hat. You see, when we get this, our life is our ministry. Mary Williams said, if you have an address book, you have a ministry. Right? Not all you're going to go with the title. You can or can't. I don't know. I really only use it if I'm trying to get in the hospital. You know? <laughs> I'm, yes, I'm Reverend Marty. Let me through. <laughs> right? Wherever we are, that's who we need to be. And so I had this realization. I had this realization as I went through practitioner training and study that it wasn't the license that gave me the thing. It was the consciousness that gave me the thing. And so I established that before I got the license. When I went through ministerial school, I was a minister before I actually got a license to be a minister. And I was an ordained minister because that relationship was with God before I actually had an ordination. You see, when we get this, who we are is what matters. Who we are. So often we approach life by thinking that when the circumstances change, when the situation changes, when conditions change around us, then we'll really step into our power. And I'm going to tell you that if you don't make the change and make the commitment, it doesn't change. It's wishful thinking. It's hopeful. Probably better to be hopeful than not be hopeful, but at some point, we got to put it into action. And so commitment, then, to me, I had a wonderful teacher many years ago, and he was talking, basically, actually, I was part of a, my first, I was actually on a board before I went into ministry, and we had a fundraiser guy come in and help us, and he had this conversation, and he said, you know, I buried my mom not too long ago and it was really interesting because in going through her effects going through her calendar going through her checkbook you could tell exactly what she was committed to there was a check for her church every Sunday there was you know again so so I love that idea because I had another friend who was less gracious said don't Tell me what you're committed to. I don't want to hear it. And I said, show me your calendar. Show me your checkbook. I'll tell you what you're committed to. I know. That's what I said. Whoa. That was direct. But it was true. Right? I can say I'm committed to my, my physical well-being. And you might ask, how much time do you spend at the gym? Well, and I said, well, I don't go to the gym. I watch fitness shows on TV. Does that, you know, <laughs> does that count? Right? <laughs> Turns out, waving as you go by the gym is not actually considered exercise. <laughs> You're supposed to go inside and use those crazy contraptions they put all around the room. Right? Right? So, so right, do you ever do this? I'm really committed to my spiritual life. Really? Are you praying every day? Well, I, when I have time, do you meditate every day? Well, if I have time, right? So, so what I hear when I say these things is, no, what I'm committed to is this, because that's what I'm doing. I'd like to be committed to something different. And so I recommit, and I share that with people that I can trust who who will support me in my commitment and will hold me accountable. Accountability is the best thing we have. It's the most important tool we will have as a spiritual community as we continue to grow. Do we keep our word with each other? Throughout the years, I've been in churches where people would say, oh, I'd love to help if I'm there. Okay. I said, well, I'd love to speak if I'm there on Sunday. <laughs> I'll let you know, right? It's kind of hard to have a service without somebody speaking, right? And if I have somebody else come in and speak for me, I would expect them to be here. Or I don't hire them. But sometimes we do this thing around volunteers. Well, you know, they're just volunteers. I'm like, oh, don't even get me started. They are human beings making commitments. 
And if we love each other, we support each other in our commitments and we hold each other in loving accountability to who we say we want to be. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Yes. Don't judge you and say, well, now I can't love you because you said you'd do this and you didn't do that. It's like, no, I love you. Now let's talk about what just happened, right? It's what we do if you're an effective parent. You love your kid and you tell your kids you love them no matter what. And we're going to talk about your behavior from time to time. You're not your behavior. But in holding ourselves accountable to the thing we are committed to, in sharing that with others who will also hold us accountable, that's when life happens. And that's when providence moves too. I don't know how the universe knows this, but it does. Whether you're just talking about it or whether you're actually committed to it. So then you make that commitment, you pray about it, you start taking action on it, you start doing the things, and all of a sudden out of nowhere comes a phone call or a person or a situation. Like, wow. I've prayed with people for over 30 years now, and I'm never surprised that the demonstration happens, but I always marvel at how it happens. Like, they always say, oh, Marty, you're not going to believe this. I'm like, yeah, I will. <laughs> I've been doing this a long time. I would believe it. And so we prayed, and all of a sudden somebody called, and then the, the blip, blip, right? And there it is. But when we're hoping, and we're wishing, and we're dreaming, there's a song, yeah. hoping and dreaming. Okay, I'll, well, I, won't, I won't do that because I don't know the words. Otherwise, I would break right into a song right now, but... <laughs> Right? It's about making that commitment. It's about supporting ourselves, supporting each other in living in integrity, in alignment. That the words that I speak, that the thoughts that I hold, that the beliefs that I hold, and the actions I take support the same idea. Shouldn't be too hard. You'll just spend the rest of your life doing that like I've been, right? And it's all right. It's not about being perfect. It's about making the progress. It's about recognizing where the power lies. You see, he says this very beautifully. Murray says this very beautifully. Not in providence moves and then you're committed, but make the commitment. And when you make the commitment, then the possibility expands. So for me, I, I, I'm always, I always admire great, great leaders. Nelson Mandela, I just watched. I don't, Invictus was on TV not too long ago, which is a great movie about him coming out of prison and leading a country and working with the soccer team. Because he realized that the country had to have a common vision. And they might fight about everything else, but you get people on the same side of a team and how he partnered with that and as they took the World Cup and how it changed a nation. Now, Nelson Mandela is an amazing person. He spent all those years in jail and left jail, became the leader, and had no desire to punish those who had harmed him, but rather moved the country into reconciliation. It wasn't to deny that it happened, but it was to move it forward. Think about that. What was he committed to? He was committed to, and he said very beautifully, he said, I have fought against white domination, and I have fought against black domination. I have cherished the idea of a democratic and free society in which all persons live together in harmony and with equal opportunities. It is an ideal which I hope to live for and to achieve. But I, if need be, it is an ideal for which I am prepared to die. You see, we like to heroize people that have died for something, which is beautiful. And a lot of our great leaders have died in pursuit of their cause. But the question is, what are we living for? Are you willing to live for this ideal? Are you willing to live for this vision? Are you willing to commit your heart and soul 
to being the person you know you can be. I think that's exciting. In closing, go back to the words of Goethe, who said, whatever you can do or dream you can, begin it. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. Begin it now. I would share with you that creation starts from this moment forward. Whatever is behind you is behind you. But that commitment to the dream, to the vision, to the action starts right now and goes forward. So I bless you on the journey. Let us pray. As we simply recognize and know right here and right now that there is indeed one life, one power, one presence, one being. And this presence, whether we call it God or life or spirit, is universal, everywhere present, always available. It is that thing which delights in its self-expression. And so we know that we are not separate from the one, but rather we live, move, and have our very being in it, as it has its being in us. In this moment, we humbly accept the power of being co-creative beings, the power of knowing how to use the mind and the body and the belief all in perfect alignment for a greater good. We know that right here and right now we are whole beings and we allow that wholeness to express as health, as well-being, as vitality. We know that indeed the only reality is love. And so we free ourselves of anything unlike divine love. We fully and fully forgive ourselves and those who we have perceived have harmed us. We release that which no longer serves us and enter into that divine state of grace. We know that we are abundant beings right here and right now because we are one with the source and the substance of all good. How wonderful it is. You see, the master teacher taught us that the kingdom of heaven, the spiritual dimension is right here, right now. Not over there, but here and now. And as we awaken to it, we simply allow ourselves to experience and express love and life more fully. We choose to be a blessing to all that we meet because we have been richly blessed. We bless this spiritual community, this divine idea unfolding. We bless our brothers and sisters around the planet. We hold a vision for a planet at peace and for a world that works for all. And as always, we bless our priests, rabbis, ministers, and teachers of all faiths and all traditions. For we know there are many pathways to the divine, and so we honor and celebrate them all. How good it is to know this truth. And so I invite you in this moment to simply look, ask yourself, what am I committed to? And am I willing to be fully and completely supported in living my vision? Will I commit to it? And know that the universe moves to. How good it is to know this truth. So I simply give thanks. I know it is already established. I know it unfolds perfectly in divine timing and in perfect order. So I simply allow it to be so. As together we say, and so it is. Amen.